So hi, my name is Kit Needham. I'm the director of Project Olympus, which is the startup incubator program for Carnegie Mellon University. And I am joined by my colleagues, um, uh, Stephanie at the Pitt Law School. Do you wanna introduce yourself? You're, you're muted, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Dangle. I'm a professor at the law school and uh, Kit and I have been working together um, with David and Babs on this for probably seven years, um, wow. uh, presenting uh, seminars and workshops for entrepreneurs from Pitt CMU in the greater Pittsburgh region. Um, we also have some law students on the line, hopefully, so I'm excited about their uh, benefiting from this experience as well. And Babs? Yeah, I'm Babs Carrier. I'm director of the Big Idea Center at uh, University of Pittsburgh. We're part of the Innovation Institute, and I work with um, students, freshmen to postdoc, on all different kinds of programs. I've got a few students uh, that are here that I see today, and uh, a couple of my colleagues, Brent Rondon is here, Don Morrison's one of my entrepreneurs and residents, and um, there's probably more, but I can only see a few at a time when we have the screen share. So okay. thanks for coming, everybody. So Don, I want to give you an honorary mention because you wear more other hats, another hat. Do you want to talk, uh, introduce yourself? You're on mute right now. Sure. Uh, one of the other hats I wear, in addition to being an EIR under Bab's great leadership at the Big Idea Center, is I'm chairman of Deal Flow for Blue Tree Allied Angels, which is the region's largest um, and I think most successful angel investment group. We have about 75, 80 members, uh, mostly in Western Pennsylvania, up, up to Erie. And uh, uh, we've been around since 2003 and uh, deal flow is stronger and better than ever. Yeah, well, we're definitely the most active uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region, so, so. okay. Uh, so what we do, this is a, the Start Smart series, and I'll introduce David at the end, but our Start Smart smart series is a part of what we call our connects program and it is an opportunity for anybody who um, is starting something and looking for a team member anybody who looks to join a team uh, anybody who has any announcements or anybody who needs anything this is an opportunity for you to reach out to um, some of the now like 28 attendees and just say your name say what you're working on and then what you're looking for uh, so, do we have any uh, brave volunteers that want to start? Well, I can, I can start. Um, I'd be happy to start, actually. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Great. Well, my name is Kyle Weich. I apologize if I'm looking here up here. I got two screens. Uh, I am a <laughs> recent Pitt alumni as of 2019. Right now, I'm an admissions counselor at Pitt, but I also have a company known as Ecotone Renewables. And so we take food waste and we turn it into electricity and fertilizer. Hopefully we're closing the food loop. Um, at the moment, right now, we're looking for more legal services. So we're looking to restructure all of our legal documents, make sure they're uh, copacetic and everything like that. Um, so we're looking for anybody who has legal background um, and any information to help us guide us along those paths. Okay, well, Kyle, would please put your contact information in the chat room. So anybody who can help you out, um, they'll know how to find you. Let's see, see how that works? Kyle did that perfectly. Um, and I did not set him up ahead of time for that. So uh, <laughs> anybody else want to give it a go? Well, okay, but we will do this before every one of these sessions. So um, next time, if you have, you're at that stage where you're looking for something, um, we'll, um, we'll catch you and maybe toward the end, if there's time, we'll, we'll ask out again. So at this moment, I'm gonna turn this over to our, uh, by the way, I also wanna introduce Tiffany, who is, works for Babs, and she's our, our Zoom Meister um, for this evening. Um, so now I'm going to introduce David Lehman. David Lehman is a partner at KNL, what, KNL Gates, and he has uh, worked with startups for. I don't want to <laughs> show how a old you are, David. Yeah, okay. a while. So, <laughs> one of our favorite startup lawyers, and he's been working with since, since the beginning on this startup series, and uh, so. 
uh, we this one particular session is we're sort of more open-ended and a little unstructured and we'll be talking he some introductory remarks but then we're going to ask you what are your legal questions and kyle you probably have a few just already cranked up from what you were saying uh, so it is your chance and also on here is and excuse me if i did this uh reed mcmanagle reed you want to introduce yourself Hey everybody, I'm Reed McManigle. I work in the technology transfer office at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I've been working at tech transfer or the funding of startup companies in Pittsburgh for about 35 years. So I have very, very broad knowledge, sometimes not very deep, but very broad. I know lots of, <laughs> a bit about lots of different things. Um, within the tech transfer office, my role is uh, as mentor in residence. So I work with uh, faculty and PhD students who are working on startups and help them create those companies, get connected to investors, outside entrepreneurs, and uh, help them then grow by uh, raising money and uh, getting customers. And he also worked for a period of time over at the Pitt Tech Transfer Office, right? Yeah, I was there for, I think, 10 years. I was at the predecessor to the Innovation Works when it was the Ben Franklin Center. Um, I was at Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse. I'm on the screening committee for Blue Tree Allied Angels. On an investment committee for the city of Pittsburgh, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> okay. So, at any rate, you've got some real talent here. And uh, so, we've asked David and, and Reed to participate in this because sometimes the legal questions are more university based, and other times it's more you know, company based. So, at this point, I'm going to put myself on mute. I know you're all saying it's about time. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to shut up and we're going to let. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, kick it off. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, Kip. Um, and what, I, what I'll do is go through some items fairly quickly. Um, again, trying to get to questions uh, toward the end. Uh, but you should feel free to interrupt me, um, ask questions along the way, and, uh, and I'll be happy to, to answer. There's no reason to wait. Uh, so feel free to, to interrupt in any way you can. Uh, uh, that's it's much more interesting. Um, let me let me start with the the, uh, the title of uh, starting a business with an eye toward an exit because this is what I want to emphasize um, and you'll see in my little note at the, the main point at the end is that um, <clears throat> as you form a company you move forward through it I always think that you should have the exit in mind and be prepared for that from the very beginning. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive and it feels like, well, yeah, that's why. But, but we'll talk a little bit during the course of the, 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 this, uh, this evening how important it is. And it's easy if you're doing it up front, uh, if you're thinking about what is setting it up so that if I, uh, with a buyer um, in mind. And so one of the things I want you to think about, or we should think about, is you're forming a company is, what would a buyer think about what I'm doing? Am I making it easier or harder for an exit? Am I increasing the value for an exit? Uh, am I going to have to go get somebody's consent? And we'll talk a little bit about those kinds of things as we walk through here. Um, some of the things that um, one should, uh, thinks about when they start a company is the type of entity and limiting your liability. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The founder arrangements. You know, it, contracts, every, every startup does contracts. Um, and so let's talk about what they are and the importance. Of it, and, and everybody signs non-disclosure agreements. So let's talk about those a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about intellectual property, um, understanding, of course, that I'm not an intellectual property lawyer. I'm not a patent lawyer. I don't even play one on TV, um, but I can spell patent, which is good. Um, but, we'll, um, but we'll talk a little bit about intellectual property and an approach to that. Employment and consulting, and then regulatory matters, um, in particular relating to formation and raising capital. And that's sort of the high, that's a lot. So I'm not going to go very deep, um, but I'll, we'll touch on those things. Uh, and those are, and then maybe we can go deeper with your questions. And I actually might even blast through some of these uh, slides. Um, questions before I get started? Hearing none. Um, David, so, I just have a question. Do you want them to uh, either interrupt or put them in the chat room and then um, perhaps, it, I mean, we can I, monitor it and let you know. Well, I, well I'm not, mon go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I've already interrupted, so I'll I'll use my uh, voice mute unmute interruption. But uh, I guess we could also use chat. W one thing I just wanted to point out, David, I agree 100 percent that that most companies should be thinking about an exit from from day one. H however, many many startups are not necessarily focused on an exit. There's many startups 
in what you know startup community considers lifestyle businesses. Yep. Not not angel investable. And, you know, there's no judgment. There's no right or wrong, but it really depends on the type of business. You might have a dog walking service or you know a restaurant idea or something, which is perfectly legitimate good, you know, early stage company, but it, it, it won't require necessarily a lot of other people's money. But if you have a high growth potential in your business uh, and you will be looking to raise other people's money, then by all means, you have to start off with that in, in, in mind, uh, build towards an exit from day one. But I think you have to make that first decision as a startup. Are you a lifestyle business or a high growth of uh, business that'll be funded with other people's money. So I, I agree with that. Um, and, and I always joke, you'll, you'll see a slide in here that I, that I always say that there's a, uh, you make decisions based upon the two, the, two, the, the two people on your shoulder. One's a buyer, one's an investor. And I always say one's an angel, one's a devil, and you can decide which one's which um, along the way. Uh, and, and you make decisions based upon that. I, I, I will say even a lifestyle company, in my view, from the beginning should set themselves up for, in case they want to be sold. And so what I mean by that is some of the things we're going to talk about, which is keeping your minutes and keeping your contracts and making it so that it can be sold um, is helpful uh, because, uh, because you may be sold. And it's really hard to, 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 uh, to create the world in 2020 hindsight and recreate those things later when, if you want to sell it. So, um, so even the lifestyles, I would argue, should think about uh, set it up for, for, for sale. Um, and think about that. Uh, and, and, but that's, that's just, but, but I agree with you. It's certainly far more acute in the case of a thing where you're trying a, a company where you're high growth, uh, going to take capital or even not take capital and try to sell it. Um, you know, the most, most, and, and you don't have to take money to sell it. I mean, you, we have lots of companies that come to a decision point and you decide, okay, do I want to take additional capital? Do I want to license the technology or, and, or do I want to just get out? And, that, and that's a decision you make at any point. And oftentimes people say, you know what? And we've had them say, I don't want to go through that process. Let's just sell it out early for the technology and the people and, and, uh, and get out early and go on to my next game. So I, I agree with you. And, and to answer your question, I, I prefer interruptions about how to ask questions. Cool. Say that again. You prefer what? In interruptions. Interruptions. So okay. he doesn't right. want Q and A to necessarily uh, happen at the end. I think the best way to do Q and A in this kind of a setting also is to, uh, to put something out on chat, and Tiffany can then monitor the chat and say, "Hey, there's a question," because otherwise okay. it's very hard to, you know, to do it otherwise. Well, that's fine. Cool. Then let's do it. All right. Starting with a choice of entity. Um, and I, again, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but you'll see there, those are all the, the, the list of companies that one can, um, can choose, which is, you know, corporations, S corporation, the liability company, sole proprietorships, benefit corporation, B corporation. I mean, they're, they're all over and I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, and we're going to focus on some of the considerations uh, that you go through when you choose which one. Um, and we do, we do another uh, start smart that, talks about just this formation that just talks about these. I do want, however, um, want to just get one um, nomenclature out of the way, just because people are more comfortable, I think, with corporations than they are the limited liability companies. And so just the way, and everybody knows that uh, the owner of a corporation is a shareholder and it's managed by the board of directors and the directors uh, appoint the officers. That's pretty, everybody knows that. The analogy on the on the limited liability company side is its owners instead of shareholders or members and uh and it's uh and it's just have directors that call managers so that's just the nomenclature so when you hear it you'll know what it is owners of owners of limited liability companies are members and and they and then and the board of directors are, are board of managers no big deal but just a good thing to know and which of the entity, which entity to be? This is, here's the best answer. It depends. Which is the classic lawyer-like answer. So why should this be any different? Um, I do want to spend one moment on why. Why should one uh, form an entity? Um, and there's a, a variety of reasons, but the principal reason is to limit personal liability. 
uh, you know, one of the wonderful things about our system is that the owners of the entity are not liable for the debts and obligations of the entity. So as a corporation, the shareholder is not liable, as generally is not liable for the debts and liabilities of a corporation. And in a limited liability company, the members are not liable for the debts and liabilities of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, a limited liability company. That's kind of cool. I mean, so they can't come. So they can't come after you. So what you put into the company, that's what you're, uh, that's what you're, uh, you're liable for. So that's that's good. And that's uh, so. I want to pause there and make sure we emphasize that. There are exceptions to that, um, and so one wants to know when you're hitting those exceptions. One exception is that what's called the piercing the corporate veil, which is that if you don't adhere to the corporate formalities, if you don't treat that company like an entity, like a real thing then um, a third party can what's called pierce the corporate veil and, and say, you know, there really wasn't a corporation. You really didn't treat it like a corporation. You treat it like you're, yourself. So we're not going to, as they say, um, it, uh, recognize the, that entity. What does that mean to, 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 to uh, adhere to the corporate formalities? It's fairly simple. It's things like opening a bank account in the corporation names. Don't commingle your funds. When you, when you get a check for for the corporation, you put it in the corporation's checking account. When you um, when, you know, so you don't you you have a separate bank account and you keep the corporation or the, I'm going to use corporation, but the entity's assets separate. When you sign pieces of paper, contracts we're going to talk about, you sign on behalf of the company. It's you know, Shalemiel LLC by David Lehman, right? I mean, it's just that, not just David Lehman. So you do it by you know by that person as the, on behalf of the entity. You keep minutes of board meetings and shareholder meetings. And by the way, that's, that goes to sort of the acquisition. If you have all of those minutes and, and you do it along the way, then when you go to sell or get venture capital, you have it available and then you can show it to, to them and they can see what's going on. That's part of the due diligence process. So doing that not just does not just help the, uh, the, here's the corporate veil, but it also helps in the exit or, or uh, financing side. So. And the, and the other one is sort of personal guarantees. People, you, you, you form an entity and then people sort of accidentally or don't just sort of willingly sign, sign uh, personal guarantees, which sort of ruins the whole point. <laughs> because if, if you, uh, the, the most classic when you start is when you, maybe you lease space and the landlord says, well, there's nothing in your company. So you, you sign a, a guarantee. And that's sometimes done and you know it, but know that that's an exception to our uh, no liability for the, for the liability for the, uh, for the corporation or the entity. So David, I'm just going to reemphasize the fact about keeping documents at every one of those records. Um, and Don can attest that when the companies show up at Blue Tree looking for funding, and usually at that point they are getting close to when they're going to run out of cash. What is right. the most common reasons for delay in them getting funded is they they don't have all their documents together. Uh, for due diligence. And so if you start to get in that habit from day one, of, you know, just, I don't care, print it out, punch holes in it and put it in a notebook, uh, but keep every record. Yep, agreed, totally agreed. The other, other thing I would suggest that you, you showed several different potential uh, structural types, David. Uh, typically the companies that are on the fast track to grow and know they're going to raise other people's money, typically start off as an LLC uh, because LLCs can easily be converted to C-Corps, which is a preference for most angel groups for, for tax purposes. So, you know, if you're on a fast track to grow your company, you know, the majority, vast majority are LLCs that at some point convert to a C-Corp. Correct. Um, and, and, and let me, uh, th that's exactly right. And let me, we're going to actually go into a little more detail on exactly those points. Exactly. Um, because, and so there's a variety of reasons um, that you choose. For the most time, most of the time you end up being, uh, to your point, either a C-Corp or an LLC, limited liability company, generally, putting aside uh, some others. Um, because they give you the, the, the limited liability, which like a partnership does not. Some of the considerations related to that are tax considerations. And one, one is, just to give you a couple examples, is double taxation. So for example, a C corporation is subject to double taxation. It's, it's taxed at the corporate level and the individual level, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and so when you make a, a dividend, 
um, you know, when you make money at a corporation, it pays at the corporate level and, it, and, the, individual, and the individual pays. Um, yeah, um, a, a, an LLC as a pass-through, and that's corporation, does not pay tax, it only pays at the individual level. So here's an example, just to give you some sense of this, and this, this is not necessarily determinative, but it's, it's important to understand, which is that, for example, if you had $100 of income, on a C Corp level, the corporation would pay $21, that would leave you $79. Then if you, um, then if you gave that out to the shareholders, then the, the shareholder would pay $16, and, you, and the shareholder would end up with $63. As an LLC, an LLC that, that only pays a single layer of tax, so the corporation wouldn't pay. You have an individual tax of only twenty dollars, based upon the, the, the assumed tax rate, with only eighty dollars, eighty dollars left over. Much. I, I'm not a genius, but I think eighty is better than sixty-three. So, um, so in that case, if you're, if it's better to, that's a better result. So that's one thing to think about when, when, um, when deciding. Having said that. There's some other David, benefits. David, so, will you be talking about pass-through of losses? Yes. Investor? Well, let me, yep, yep, yep. Well, actually, let me do that right now. I mean, you can also, you're exactly right. The other advantage to an LLC is that you can, if you put money in, the losses can be passed through to the investor. So they can actually uh, basically take, take it off their, ta their taxes. They can deduct it. Um, and a C-Corp, you can't pass it through. The losses remain in the C-Corp. And it's carried forward, so you get end up with a net operating loss for the corporation. So when it does make money, you can use those losses to offset income going forward. Which sometimes, by the way, read you know that has that has value to the corporation going forward. Uh, but sometimes investors, um, to, to Don's point originally, sometimes investors like LLCs up front because they can invest and they get the losses and they can use those those losses um, uh, to, to, for the tax benefit. So that's one of the benefits to an LLC as well. You, you can get the, uh, you can use the losses. <clears throat> Again, this is a whole lot of stuff and nobody's gonna remember this, but the point is that uh, when there's a startup, you wanna think about some of the tax implications. Now, one, based upon what we just said, based upon single layer of tax in the sale and the use of losses, one can say to themselves, why in God's green earth would anybody ever not do a C corporation? Well, there's a wonderful code section called 1202, which is a qualified small business which get this one. I mean, there's, there's um, people spend a lot of time trying to get lower tax rates, like going from, you know, from the capital gain to 20% instead of ordinary income. This one, if you do it right now, it's a tax rate of zero. And that's my favorite tax rate. Okay. Zero. And the way you do that is you, if you qualify for this, you have to hold on to the C corp for over five years. It has to be certain kinds. Most, most of the companies that I deal with qualify. Um, Unfortunately, you're capped at $10 million per shareholder. That's too bad. Um, but the point is that if you, if you um, invest, hold it for over, six, over five years, exit, um, and it's a stock sale, you, get, you, can, you basically pay no capital gain. And I've, I've now sold a number of companies in the last few years who have really taken advantage of this, and it's a nice, nice way to do it. <laughs> um, that's one, to, that's one of the advantages to converting or being starting as a C Corp because in a C Corp, you, um, you, you can start that five-year program earlier. So that's one of the advantages of starting as a C Corp early. I want to touch on one other thing and then I'll come back to that. One of the other things to think about is um, people, I've ran, run into this more, if you're getting a lot of government financing, just pay attention to grants if you're getting grants because they can be income. And so you wanna make sure that you have a match of the expense to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, um, to the uh, grant um, and uh, because you don't want phantom income. <clears throat> and another one I've run into recently is that in the LLC structure with the pass-through, some people don't like that income even though you're getting distributions because it shows up on your uh, tax return. And if you're doing things like filing for, uh, for <clears throat> um, student loans and that kind of thing for your kids, that 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 uh, um, sort of increases the amount of, of income on your tax return. So a couple other things I want to make sure I get on the table. One, um, if you are seeking funds from a venture capitalist uh, or a VC, 
actually this easy this decision is pretty easy vcs don't invest in in, in, in llc's but sometimes private equity will sometimes certainly angels do sometimes like it vcs will not have, have, uh, invest in in, in llc's <clears throat> um, we already talked about the law availability of losses you can go if you, you can you can go to c corp you can um, go up you can't do that with an llc um, i'll skip the last one and the, and the one thing that um, sort of Don alluded to, but I want to make very explicit, is that if you can't decide and you, you do all the hand wringing, you can't decide what kind of entity it is, then you're better off to start with an LLC because you can readily go from an LLC to a C corporation tax, tax efficiently. You cannot go from a C corp to an LLC tax efficiently. There's lots of tax, negative tax consequences. So the most traditional, the, the most Easiest uh, way to do it is to start an LLC if you don't know, and then convert to a C Corp later. Now, Could you again, Don, whether Blue Tree has a preference for LLC versus C Corp? We uh, we say we have a preference for C Corps, but we continually invest in LLCs. So um, do. You know, watch what we do, not what we say. <laughs> um, there's, there's, you know, as David said, there's, there's definitely uh, tax benefits to C corporations, um, but we do invest in in LLCs. Um, one, one thing I just wanted to point out for some of the students that might be on the call, uh, David mentioned that uh, VCs don't invest in LLCs. And just to make sure everybody's aware of the difference between angels and VCs, angels invest in the hundreds of thousands of dollars up to maybe a million or $2 million, generally speaking. VCs generally invest in maybe three to five million as a minimum and, and go up from there. So, you know, there's a there's significant difference in the, in the scale of uh, raise between angels and VCs. I just wanted to, to point that out. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, it's not, there's not no easy answer to this. And I think about it. Um, I mean, if you're leaning toward a venture capital, I mean, I, I tend to t tell people to go straight to a C Corp from day one. Um, it, it's just easier and you get that, that five year clock started. Um, if you're, you know, if, if you're, if you really intend to sell it, then, then I lean towards C Corp. So, David, uh, we've got yep. a question in the uh, chat box. What if you're going to go for an IPO? Uh, C. Okay. But you could still start as an LLC. You and can. Then, yeah. Yeah. But, but I would say, I mean, it, 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 going for an IPO, um, you know, you don't go from day one to IPO. There's going to be lots for, between hither and thither. And and you would be an unusual company that could go from here to IPO without without some venture capital. So I suspect that you're gonna you're gonna end up as a as a uh, as a C corp by virtue of the venture capitalists along the way. Not not every that doesn't say that every company that becomes a, a, a IPO is a venture capitalist, but more often than not, you end up going venture capital. I can jump in there, David. I think um, you know in part of that, yeah, to go IPO, you have to be a C corp. And the thing is, what you have to look at in the early stage when you're starting your company is what your capital needs are going to be. If you're a software company or you're an app company, you know you may not need venture capital. If you're going to build something that is like a robotics thing, right, and 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 it's going to take a huge amount of capital, you're going to have to go to institutional investors. It's very rare that you won't do that. And I think hence why David says, if, he, if you know you're going to do that, he'll recommend that you do that right away, right? And just not bother going through the LLC to yep. C Corp. Yep. Agreed. Other questions? Um, David, I had a, a question. Most of the um, C corporations that we see are incorporated in Delaware because of the favorable or more favorable tax laws in terms of Delaware C corps. Um, are, are there any reasons when a company should consider being a non-Delaware C corp? So, um, 
you know, I, um, let me think about that for uh, By and large, the bulk of my clients um, end up in Delaware, in part for tax, but more importantly, just because the uh, the um, <clears throat> because everybody knows Delaware law, they're comfortable with Delaware law. If you're seeking venture capital outside of Pennsylvania, um, the venture capitalists like to see Delaware uh, because they're, again, they're comfortable with it, they know it. Um, so there's some distinct advantages to it. The only time I think about not doing Delaware um, is when um, you're not going to do VC. You're not going the large route, and you're locate and you're and you're basically regionally based. So take take the example uh, Don's example earlier of the uh, of the um, <clears throat> of the restaurant or something like that that's going to operate fairly locally. There's no good reason to do Delaware. You know, then you might as well just stay and stay in the state in which you're going to operate. And that's, for example, if you're going to open up a restaurant chain in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, then then be a Pennsylvania corporation. And there's no good reason to go to Delaware uh, because you'll end up qualifying to do business in Pennsylvania and doing Delaware. And there's no good reason to do that. But if you're the if you're a technology high growth company, then I I, I tend to just go straight to uh, Delaware. Do not pass go not quite two hundred. Cool. David, can you mention something about the relative costs of doing these kind of things? So what, which kind of thing? You mean one entity LLC over another? LLC versus C-Corp if you're a cash-strapped startup. Yeah, you know, Reed, that's a good question. And um, they tend to be about the same price because if I do, if, I, if I'm more than one, uh, assume for the moment that I'm more than one, than one owner, um, to do a, 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 a C-Corp properly i got to do article i got to do articles or certificate incorporation the uh bylaws and a shareholder a shareholder agreement right for the, the degree among the uh, shareholders what their arrangements are if i do an llc i got to do a certificate organization and i got to do an operating agreement which is basically the bylaws and the shareholder agreement all in one and so the cost to do both it, it tends out tends to be about the same they're not they're not much different uh you know if there's a slight Slightly more expensive for LLCs just because operating agreements tend to be more um, more individualized and more negotiated. But having said that, that's a bit of an overstatement because shareholder agreements are individualized too. So they tend to be about the same. One's not more expensive than the other, uh, and so um, you know uh, they're about the same. And you know, so I don't know if that answers your question. They're about the same cost. And the process, the process to do it is is relatively is is similar. You you have to address the same issues. All right. How do I talk about this? Um, so. Um, when we form, I'm going to talk a little bit about founders. And I don't spend a lot of time on this, but we just touched on this a little bit, which is that when you form, once you form the entity, we got to think a little bit about the, the, the founders and what the arrangement is with them. Um, and uh, and, uh, and I just mentioned there's a shareholder agreement, an operating agreement. Um, I lost track of my things here. There I go. Um, and and the one of the, so one is the employment agreement consulting arrangement with the with one of the with the founders, and you just want to be clear as to you know what roles are they going to play, what compensation are they going to get. I'll talk a little bit about intellectual property and restricted covenants in a moment, severance. Um, but you also need to figure out how much each equity each founder is going to get, and we're not going to go through the whole analysis here of it. But let, let me just give you a couple thoughts about it. Um, one is that um, I think it's important to bear in mind that you want to incent the people that sort of the third bullet, but I think it's probably the most important one on here. Incent the people that are going to provide more value, the most value going forward. Uh, and you got to make sure that that's the case. You got to make sure that people that are going to be, be working with the company and providing value going forward are incented to do that. And, and they get a, a disproportionate amount of the, uh, of the uh, value. You also, on the first point, we, I mean, we are going to admit that we could provide other options. You're going to provide, perhaps take in additional capital. People are going to get diluted. Uh, 
So again, in thinking about how much each person gets, you want to think about the inevitable dilution that they're going to get. Right? Dilution being a fancy term for you're going to get reduced in your equity and interest in the companies can reduced as more people come in. Um, you know, some people just, they say, okay, well, this is easy. I got five founders. <laughs> this is easy. I got a hundred divided by five. That's 20. Each, each founder gets 20%. And that may be the answer, but that'd be quite a coincidence uh, because when you think about the relative contributions and the relative value they're going to bring, I'm really so be surprised if it was even. even. Um, and my last comment is if there's two of you, the, the one instinct is always to say, okay, 50-50. And that just, that, that, as you can imagine, is the lawyer's nightmare because what happens when they can't agree? And what do you do? Um, and there are some solutions to it. Um, you have what's, what's fancily called a shotgun provision, which is a buyout from one to the other that you can do. You can have a third party as a director. You can do some arbitration to figure out solutions. But sometimes it's better just not to have 50-50 in the first place. Uh, sometimes, it's in, sometimes we do it um, when we know we're about to take in additional capital. I mean, do the 50-50 because you know we're just about to take it out. It's gonna dilute it and it's, gonna, it's, only, it's only gonna be a moment. But otherwise, we try to avoid 50-50. What's really important on a couple of things that are important to think about in the founding is to make sure your founders are vesting over time. I mean, it's really a shame when one of the, you know, when you, when you have three, three founders, each one of them gets a third the day after you found that one of the, one of the founders says, Oh, by the way, I just took a job with, uh, with Uber. And so I'll be working with them. Good luck, good luck with that. Um, and they walk away with a third of the company. That's not fun. Um, and so you want to make sure that you invest people. Investing is a fancy term for you earn it over time rather than get it up front. And so you got to think about what the timing of that is and when that happens. Sometimes we even buy back, have a right to buy back the vested stock when people leave, maybe at fair market value at that point. Because again, it's not great to have people who are formally involved in the company having large stakes in the company. That tends to be a little more, um, a little more controversial. If you have more than one founder, you need to think about who's going to decide. We always say who decides, who decides. Who's on the board? Who's going to decide who's on the board? Who are the officers, directors? Just think about those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and then we want to think about, about restrictions on transfer. You, you you know, you, you, I don't want to go into business with, with Babs, and then, and then it turns out the next day I wake up and now Reed's my partner. That would be terrible. And so, we, we, uh, so, so you want to have control over who it's going to be, a right of first refusal, some kind of veto, something along the way. Um, those are some of the things to do with that. Let me pause there on the founder arrangements, see what questions are. I did that fast, but maybe there's things you'd like to delve into a little bit more. Um, I just want to make a plug for an upcoming Connects event on October 8th on splitting the founders pie. We do every year with Frank Delmar. So it's all about this topic of like, how do you, how do you get that initial split correct? And how do you do all these arrangements? And what does that mean in terms of future ownership of pond dilution and so on. So I encourage everybody to sign up for that Connects workshop to learn more about this particular topic. So for the Pitt students, I'll mention that all of the Connects are free and open to everyone. So, uh, but you do have to register in order to be sent the link. They are generally 1230 to 130, um, one hour. They're taped also that if you happen to miss it, as well as the PowerPoint presentations are in the workshop archives. So the way to find out about them um, is to sign up for the weekly bulletin and I can give you more information later if you need on how to do that. One, one point I wanted to uh, make on the buyback arrangements is I think it's really important to have a clean, simple formula that everybody agrees on in terms of how the company will be valued should a buyback take place while everybody is still smiling at each other. Uh, have a simple formula, you know, uh, it could be multiple of EBITDA or multiple of revenue or average of two different numbers, but, you know, a fairly simple calculation that will have uh, no mystery in the numbers and it's something that everybody agrees to up front so that when and if there is a buyback arrangement, there's already a predetermined valuation formula established. So it doesn't become part of a ugly negotiation. Agreed. Other questions? I had a question. I was wondering, um, could you give an example of say the 
five founders with 25% each, what happens whenever a VC comes in to their equity in the company? So when, when the VC comes in, they're going to take, let, let's just take an example that they have, they get 40% uh, of the company, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other, everybody else gets diluted proportionately by, the, by, by, by that 40%. So okay. they just get squished down proportionately. Okay, just that simple? That's that simple. Okay, yep. all right. thank you. Yep. And the reason, but, but that's a good point, which is to say, if you have, um, sometimes what you do at that point is um, you want to incent management to perform, right? To, to continue having a real interest in the company. And so if the, if the founders get diluted too far, um, and that, that goes to my point, one is that they don't have incentive to drive it forward anymore. And so that's a problem. So you worry about that's the reason to have not, not have permit non, uh, non participating founders to have too much because mm -hmm. especially that's, if that's the case, you got five, so they all get squished accordingly. And mm -hmm. so, so there's not much left for anybody incentivized. So for example, if you were the, you were the principal person, you just having 20% of that and then getting diluted is not perfect. There's a bit of a fix, but it's not perfect, which is often when, VCs come in second, third, fourth round, you'll replenish the option pool and provide more options to management uh, to, incent the, to, to, to keep the company going. So for example, if it's too much, too much dilution, they may say to you, hey, look, you're the CEO. I want to make sure you're properly incentivized. I'm going to give you another you know, a slug of options, which will vest over time to sort of reallocate a little bit. But, so that's one solution to, to the, that, uh, that dilution problem. Okay. Thank you. David, I did have a question as well. Um, I was curious for a buyback and around equity in general. For if we had in the amendment or if we had in the operations agreement that we can write an amendment to reduce equity or remove individuals from the company, how does that go about? Do we need attorneys to sign and create those documents for everyone? Or if it was written in the operations agreement, um, do we go off of something like that? So I'm not sure I understand your question, but let me just think, I mean, it, it should um, all be in the right to buy back should be in either the operating agreement or what's called the restricted stock agreement, the thing, the vesting agreement. And, um, and that should all, that should be in there. Um, and, uh, and, and you should have a lawyer help you with that uh, okay. and help you draft the operating agreement. No question about it. It's not something that you should, uh, you know, you should just uh, do it on by yourself. Um, I mean, the, 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 it has, we, uh, this sort of goes to the, the, the whole theme here about exit and, and the future. It, it, it all works until it doesn't work. Um, and, so, uh, and so when you need to go enforce that contract, you want to make sure it's enforceable. And so you want somebody to draft it in a way that it works and you have confidence it works and there won't end at Don's point and, and there won't be a lot of, there won't be any controversy or ambiguity. So that's why it's important that it be right in the first instance. Okay. Well, let me take a moment about this buyback thing that we're talking about, because I, I want to maybe emphasize this a little bit more, which is there's two kinds of buybacks. One is this vesting. So unvested stock, take it back and usually get that back for zero. So that, that's one issue. But we're talking about the other buyback is at, when a founder leaves, do you have a right to buy back at fair market value at that point or not, or some or all of their, their stock? And some VCs love this. And I, I fight this. Is, if I were to pick one area where I fight the most to get it in there for my, my clients, they don't like this, but that we put it in. And I said, well, you can decide whether you're going to exercise it later. And then they're thankful later that, that it's there. Um, and the argument goes that, look, a founder or employee, doesn't matter which one, should get the value, increase of value from the time they come to the company and the time they leave the company. But they shouldn't get the value after they leave because at that point I want to take that piece and give it to somebody else, um, and so I want to give the value from that to, to, to the next person. Uh, and so there's and, and now there, there's compromises like you could you could get to buy have the right to buy back half their stock or a proportion of their stock or something like that because sometimes people in order to attract them they want that upside they want the uh, the the the, uh, the you know the the, the lottery ticket, um, but it's worth at least considering having that kind of a buyback provision. And again, that's not for amateurs. You, you need to have somebody drafted who knows how to do it. Cool. Other questions?
Did I understand Kyle's question to be like, we already have those provisions in our operating agreement. The event has happened. Now we want to implement the provisions of that agreement. Do we need a lawyer at that point to like drop the paperwork to buy somebody out or to whatever they want to do? Exactly. Oh, thank you. That's a bit more. Yeah. Sorry about right. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And, and, and the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I would still have a lawyer look at the provision and before I exercise that right and make sure that that is being done in accordance with the agreement for exactly the same reasons, which is, and actually let me emphasize this even more. When you go to sell the company or go to do something, if there's nothing more, you know, number one, most important is ownership of the, of the company. And you want to make sure it's absolutely crisp and perfect that, that the ownership resides where you think it does. So I, the answer is yes, I would, I would have a lawyer do it, at least look at it. Thank you. And thanks, Reid, for translating. Uh, other questions that I that I won't answer. Cool. All right, move on to a quick contracts one hundred and one. How, how many we have? We have law students on here, right? They, they should they should do this one, not me. Um, but but I'll so they, you know but um, but I'll do it anyway. So this this is what we shouldn't do, folks. Um, it looks like a lot of boilerplate, but it's not. Um, and so when you sign contracts, or you know, nobody signs them that way anymore, but the point is that if you're going to do a contract, you, you, ought, you ought to read it and understand it and make sure you understand it. Um, and it looks, it's, it's, it's quite dull, even for those of us get paid for reading them, but you really need to understand it. Uh, I have had many situations where people didn't. They burdened their company with obligations that they didn't realize were in there, um, like restricted covenants or, or non-competes or all kinds of things. I had one recently where um, the client signed an, a non-disclosure agreement that we'll talk about in a moment. And in the miscellaneous provisions was a uh, non-compete, that they wouldn't compete with the other party for a period of five years. Um, it was devastating. Um, it would, it was really bad for this company. They couldn't, they, it would have, it would have put them out of business and they signed it, uh, without, without reading it or understanding it was there. Um, we negotiated it out, um, but it was really, it was really problematic. So you've got to read stuff and there's all different kinds of, this is, a li this is sort of a list of, uh, or a showing of the different kinds of, uh, 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 contracts you're going to enter into. Initially, if you're coming out of the university, there's a license will be the first thing you'll, you'll look at. Um, NDAs, et cetera. Um, I want to emphasize that you can, oral contracts with some exceptions that are listed here are, um, are enforceable. So I want to emphasize they are enforceable. These are kinds that are not, and that are not exceptions. So these kinds can be enforced uh, even though they're in writing. They're not in writing, they're oral. So for example, equity arrangements, somebody to give equity is enforceable. Um, licenses, promises to license debt investment agreements right so why do we care because here's the point startups can't afford ambiguity we can't we can't do it we need we need the performance of the people in the, in the contract we can't afford litigation if you're if you're litigating you're going to look like this little guy there um you know but you can't afford the legal fees you can't afford the distraction so uh ambiguity is not your friend um if there's a if there's an argument about a license to technology, for example, then you, you can't sell your company, you can't get investment in it because you, the, the world is unclear. So if somebody sends you a, sends you a letter and says, "Oh, by the way, I think I um, I have a right to license your technology," then you don't have exclusive use. There's cloud on it, and you're really frozen. So um, I really think it's important to make sure that that, that you don't avoid you avoid um, oral contracts. You're clear. Um, you're clear about your your um, your, um, your agreements. Here's what I mean. You ought to when you look at contracts as as, as start uh, folks starting up companies, you ought to make sure that these contracts accomplish what you want them to accomplish. And so here's some list of here. But the point is that you can't rely on the lawyer to make sure that the business terms are perfect. You are, you need to do that. You got to make sure that it accomplishes it. If you're going to buy, you know, license some technology, you got to make sure the technology is right and the business terms are exactly what you want. David, I just back to the oral contracts. Let's just say our startups are they're sort of 
talking about it now. They're trying to figure out the best plan. So they're talking a lot. So how do you prevent somebody construing the discussion from being an actual, uh, we said we would do it, or is there something more specific that happens? So that's a really good question. <laughs> and um, and at, um, I don't know that I have any great answers to it. Um, other than, um, here, I'll tell you what not to do. So don't have, don't have oral agreements, um, which is, I mean, that, that, yours is sort of an accidental oral agreement. My concern is the, is a, an oral con the handshake, right? Um, don't do that. Put it in writing and make sure that it's clear in writing. Um, second is when you send emails, um, this is sort of as, uh, related to it. I do a lot of things where it says, by the way, this won't be binding unless and until we sign, sign bind, uh, final documents, right? So that it's clear that you're not creating a contract. This is only a discussion. Uh, and frankly, you know, um, you know, maybe in the oral discussion, you can fall, if it looks like, feels like it's beginning to sort of teeter on it, maybe you send an email confirming that, you know, this is our discussion. There's no contract, no agreement, but this is the, this is the, this is the, uh, this is what we're talking about, right? And you word that email in a way that makes it very clear that there's no contract yet. So maybe there's a confirmatory email uh, that, that shows that there's no contract. David, could you address early stage companies that uh, don't necessarily have patents? They might have some intellectual property, maybe they're trade secrets. But what I recommend to a lot of startups is at some point they need to think about having uh, non-disclosure confidentiality agreements with their uh, key hires and also non-competes. So I can't come and work for a company for two months, learn their secrets, and then start a competitive company um, shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, recommend that strategy as well? Uh, so actually, I have more more parts in this about both of those, but 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 let's let's just uh, address it. Um, so absolutely, um, you know, with um, you should. There's a bunch of reasons to do NDAs. Let me just do one way. Um, let me just do one thing. Let me actually, can I address that in two seconds? Let me just, I want to finish this con general point in the contract and I'll come back to NDAs, um, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, because I, I want to just, while I'm here, um, on contracts more generally, um, you really want to make sure that, uh, or think about the assignment provisions because we keep thinking about exits and that sort of thing. And if you have to go consent by the people to assign the contract, that's a problem. And so you want to make sure that, uh, that you can assign the contracts. I just make sure I, I talked about that. And the other point is that on contracts, including NDAs that we're gonna talk about in a moment, um, uh, keep track of them. I mean, uh, Kit mentioned earlier about people coming to Blue Tree and not having all their ducks in the line. It's really important to have them. So keep your contracts in places that, that's easily accessible, that you have lists of them and you can do it. And as importantly, uh, have a system in place to, to, to uh, so you don't miss deadlines. Um, I've seen many a company not have that kind of process in place and they miss deadlines, whether it be options to renew leases or, or payments or whatever it is, so you need some kind of system in place. Um, so your question about NDAs, I mean, I, I you absolutely want um, NDAs and you ought to have a form NDA um, to, and for those are the non-disclosure agreements. Um, and, and you should have, um, and it's for a variety of reasons, right? Um, it's for uh, consultants, as you say, it's potential, potential uh, vendors, um, it's uh, third parties. You, 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 you want them, uh, and, and it's also important because if you have trade secrets and you're gonna tell people about your trade secrets, then um, you need an NDA because otherwise you won't really actually be entitled to the trade secret protection because one of the requirements of trade secret is that you've, you've not used best efforts to keep it, uh, you've kept it confidential. So that's important. Um, a couple, couple points a, a little further beyond that though. Um, I don't like to rely on confidentiality agreements uh, because I always say that if, if I'm suing on a confidentiality agreement, I'm sort of, especially as a startup, I'm sort of, um, um, I'm at the bottom of the well already and I'm, I'm yelling up. So while I want them, them, um, them uh, signing it, I'm really protective of the trade secret. So for example, I'm not, if I'm a software company, I'm not giving people the source code. If I'm, um, if I'm a, 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 if I'm a, a 
I'm not giving the formula. I mean, not giving the formula to uh, of uh, Coke to people. So keep the keep the important part, um, and so and stage the disclosure. So I, I actually, um, while I, I insist on NDAs, I actually encourage people not to be very careful with with the real the real um, important stuff. Another caution is to um, often the the the, uh, the 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 dialogue becomes okay. Well, now that I'm going to do an NDA, I'm going to do a mutual NDA. So now I'm going to, uh, you know, just because the other part say, okay, well, we'll do mutual NDA. And that sounds very easy, but I, as a startup, don't always love signing an NDA. Uh, I, I'd rather say to the other party, don't give me your confidential information because there's a risk. The risk is that when you go and create something, they claim that you use their confidential information to do it. So if you're not going to, so if you're not going to get and you don't want confidential information of a third party, then maybe you don't want to push for a, 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 a mutual NDA. Maybe you just don't take their confidential information. Um, I'm going to get to non-competes in a moment, but um, those are non-disclosures. Um, questions about non-disclosures? Except for a picture of the well. Um, I, I don't know if it, it might tie into this, but um, so what would happen if, say, you're talking to people about your startup idea and mm -hmm. then say you ask someone to join, but they don't want to, but they still help out a lot. And then two years down the road, down the road, it's pretty successful and they end up suing you. Um, how would that pan out? Like the whole social network movie, like that, that type of scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Um, and that goes to my point about clarity in the first place. I mean, if you have a clear agreement with the person that says that, uh, you know, um, what their roles are going to be and, and, uh, and, uh, um, well, let me do it this way. Um, so a couple of scenarios. One is they're actually consulting with you. If they're consulting for you, then you have a consulting agreement and it's clear that it has uh, an invention assignment agreement that says whatever they created is, is owned by the company. And therefore, you shouldn't, and, and it's clear as to what they're entitled to, then, it, then that's easy. The harder part, so that, that's, that's an easy case. Mm -hmm. um, the harder case is where they just sort of, uh, they just sort of kibitz, right? They just sort of, you talk to them, you, 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 you visit about it, but they, you actually don't consummate it. And later they sue you because you stole their idea or something. Mm -hmm. um, that's harder. Um, and... Uh, a, you can never protect yourself against somebody suing you because everybody can sue anybody. Um, uh, B, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to deal with that other than sort of getting people to sign up front, sort of a non, you know, a, a kind of consulting or invention assignment agreement, whatever. Um, but there's no, there's no, I don't have a great answer as to how to solve that otherwise. Okay. Um, as I think about it. Um, uh, I guess. And then, but the thing is, I guess I could carry an NDA around everywhere and, but that one. Well, you don't want to do that. I mean, so, so the point, the point there is that you shouldn't be, I mean, what a lot of people do is they have basically two versions of their business plan. Mm -hmm. They have the version that's sort of the, the one that uh, is for people who have signed an NDA and one that has not signed an NDA. So you should have a description of your business that's, uh -oh. that, that's interesting enough to people that goes enough deep enough that's sort of interesting. It doesn't uh, doesn't give them enough to go do it themselves. And okay, that makes sense. And that's that's a pretty good strategy toward that. Okay, thank you. And I would also say there are a lot of people that just won't even sign them. I mean, I don't, right. Um, right. because I, you know. So I think I think the uh, Facebook movie just ruined everything because everybody think everybody's running around stealing everybody's idea, and that's really just not the case. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it myself but david maybe you've gotten involved no, it, it's rare you know and, and, you know um it's rare i guess the other thing i should say about that is that um that um it sort of goes to the ip um you know to the extent that i do tell people that if you have um if you're going to publish or, or things and, and you're going to think about patenting something then get the patent filed um before you before you go public with yeah. it is sort of a nice is a nice thing to do um so for a variety of legal reasons so if you're going to do it get the patent or provisional patent filed 
uh, before you publish or before you uh, before you uh, uh, disclose it to third parties. That's just great advice. Up. Can I can I jump in there, Don, real quick? I sure. just I I really think, uh, in my experience, people just think that they're going to reveal the secret sauce like right away. And quite frankly, in my opinion you know, most firms are looking for what the overall opportunity is, and you really don't need to have confidential, you know, discussions that are covered by NDAs until you're actually fairly far along. So those first couple of meetings, you should totally, you know, get some advice about a non-confidential conversation, but that's the way you should handle it so that you don't have to run around with an NDA, because I guarantee you, you will turn more people off with that approach than you get people on your side. And when the time for an NDA is when people are really looking into deep due diligence, they're really doing due diligence, and, and then they want to understand the secret sauce and how it works. But you can spend a lot of time talking about what you do, um, you know, why you do it, the effect of what you do without revealing how you actually go about, you know, mixing the this and the that to create the secret sauce recipe kind of thing. That, that's a great point, Babs. I just wanted to follow up on Kit's point. She doesn't sign NDAs. Most angel groups don't sign NDAs for, for the same reason. There's just too much exposure. We hear too many similar ideas every day. And if we signed NDAs, you know, we could have people coming back uh, for us. And uh, to your point, Babs, most, most entrepreneurs don't need to explain their secret sauce to get people interested. You know, we only entertain NDAs when we get really, really, really deep into due diligence. Yeah, and then you've kind of already decided that you're very, very interested. So, you know, learn to, you know, have good discussions that get people interested without telling them exactly, you know, exactly how you tied the knot. Like Right. And I, I, the other, other general point that I always, I always say, just because two or even three people hear the same good idea, it's really about execution. Not every uh, entrepreneur, not every team can, can make it happen. It's really about execution. So the idea is part of it, but you know, which entrepreneur and which teams can really execute, that's the, that's the magic. Totally agree. Cool, other questions? Let me let me um, spend one moment on on IP, and then I think I'll, I'll read. I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, for, for this part. But um, I, I always like to ask three questions to startups: um, Do they own own the IP? Does it fringe a third party's IP? And what are you doing to protect your IP? Um, and I think it's important to be, to at least think about all three of those. Um, ownership is: Have you ha um, have you <laughs> have you License the technology from somebody. Have you uh, have uh, do the owners have the owners signed, um, the founders signed IP uh, invention invention uh, assignment agreements where they uh, assign the IP over to the company. Um, do we have have the employees and the consultant independent contractors assigned their IP over to the company? So make sure that the company owns the IP. That's huge. Second is does it infringe on a third party's intellectual property? Have we have we, uh, has one of the parties uh, maybe invented it while they were at some other, some other uh, company, right? We always ask people, do you, do, do you, uh, are you subject to some, you know, invention assignment agreement somewhere else or some policy? Um, sometimes in the patent world, if, depending on what you're doing, you might do a patent search to see whether or not what you're doing infringes a third party, uh, par party's patent. We've all had our war stories. We're all, you know, and I did have one where a company, even after several rounds of financing, found that they their their software um, infringed a, a third party's patent. The good news is there was a good workaround, but the bad news is that we all lost a little bit of sleep. Um, and the th and third one is, what are you doing? You know, there's lots of there's several different ways to protect IP, whether it be copyright, patent trade secret, um, et cetera. And, um, and we're not gonna go through all of them here, but what I do wanna do is make sure that you've thought about which one you're going to do. Um, and uh, because it, 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 you know, it, as, as gross as it's 
largest, you can waive certain ones like patents if you don't take it to take action with this, uh, within a certain time period. So it's important to, and they're also contradictory, which is to say, if you, if you, um, you know, the point of patent is that you disclose everything uh, to the patent office, the whole world, you explain how you did it, and therefore you get patent protection. That's the contrary to the trade secret, which you get for for purposes of by by keeping it secret. So you got to um, so you got to decide which direction you're going to go in the first instance with your IP. Reed, I did the short version. Do you want to weigh in on sort of the IP side of the world? Yeah, I could, um, and I do have some slides for another presentation that I could pull up just so people have something to stare at if somebody gives me uh, co-hosting rights. Is that something I have to do? Um, I doubt it. <laughs> cool. Tiffany Better needs yet. to do it. She's a... Yeah, but, she's but like I have it and I'm not a co-host, I think. Tiffany, are you there? Can you... What needs done? She you needs... Know, we we, we can't seem to share his screen. <clears throat> Oh, I think David would have to stop sharing his screen and then. Oh, yeah, that's screen. true. That's true. I can do that. I stopped. I started. Cool. So my screen has people over top of my words. Does everybody else see it without people over top of the words? I see words. Okay. So I'm going to scroll through a, a few slides here in intellectual property. And the, the first couple slides here are to David's bullet point about, you know, ownership. So it, from a patent perspective, this starts with a discussion about who are the inventors. And inventors means a particular thing in, in the patent world. And that is the people who come up with the ideas that end up in the claims in the patent. So buried in that sentence are a couple different things. One is separating the people with the ideas from maybe the people who do all the work. So sometimes a professor will come up with an idea, the student will toil away for three years to prove that the idea actually works. And because it was the professor's idea and the, the, the student did all the work, they don't become a, a, an inventor per patent law. By the same token, similar idea, the student has the idea, goes to the professor, professor gives some advice and input here or there, um, but doesn't really contribute creatively to the idea, then it's the student that owns it all. And it's not a matter of like political power between the faculty member and the student. It's a legal standard. If you get it wrong, somebody else can come in and challenge your patent. So the second part of that is the ideas that show up in the claim of the patent. The claims of the patent are what you fight with the patent office or find the novelty of the, the invention. And you may go in with 50 claims and come out with 10 claims that get issued. And if a particular inventor only had the idea for claim 37, that claim's thrown out, they're no longer an inventor on the patent. So it's all about who comes up with the ideas that define the novelty of, of the idea as a patent. I should go to full screen here. Okay. So the next aspect of um, ownership um, relates to uh, the US patent system where we used to be um, first to invent and you had to prove when you invented something, uh, but they changed in 2013 to first to file. So if you come up with an idea, but you don't get to the patent office first, somebody else can get a patent on that idea. And that's the way the rest of the world has worked for forever. And the US uh, came around to that same standard in 2013. So the next part of ownership, say you're an inventor, is like who owns your inventive work as an inventor? And the default under US patent law is that the inventor owns it in this there's some agreement to the contrary. So typically, if you're employed by a company, when you sign your employment agreement, it says that the company owns everything that you invent. And when you're a startup, you wanna have your employees sign those kind of 
um, agreements. And when you have consultants to your startup, you want to have your consultants sign those kind of agreements. But when you're on the other side as the employee or as the outside consultant, you're probably giving up ownership to your employer or to your client. Um, within universities, um, each university has their own IP policy. Um, I can speak specifically to CMU's policy. Pitt is somewhat different. Um, CMU's policy says that the university owns inventions when there's been sponsorship. So generally that's federal grants, corporate sponsored research. Um, so typically faculty, PhD students at a university are paid on research grants and therefore the university has obligations to those funders and it can only meet those obligations by claiming ownership. So that's when CMU claims ownership. On the opposite extreme of that is if there's no sponsorship, no substantial use, which I'll define in a minute, then at CMU, the inventor's own. You know, some universities claim ownership of everything no matter what. CMU is sort of on the opposite extreme that we only claim ownership when we have to. So typically, if you're an undergraduate or master's student, um, you're not paid on sponsored research grants, so you own your IP at CMU. CMU has no claim to it. This in-between category, substantial use, um, there's a definition in the IP policy that says what substantial use is. It's a number that's adjusted for inflation. It's now around $12,000, $13,000. And if you make substantial use of university resources, then at CMU, this is very unusual, you can still own it if it wasn't sponsored work, but now you have a revenue sharing obligation. So generally, no student reaches this standard. It's typically for faculty who get a gift from Google or a foundation or something like that. The money flows through the university. It's not considered to be sponsored research. It's a gift. It's considered to be substantial use. Our faculty members start a package. They, they get you know, X amount of dollars when they come in as a new faculty member to get their lab started, hire some graduate students or so on. That's not considered to be sponsorship. So the university doesn't own it, but it's counted towards substantial use. Now, Reed, I have a question in chat for you. Please, if, go ahead. If I, you, I can't see the chat right now. I know. That's why I'm monitoring for you. If Great. you would like to publish research in a conference to attract more talent, gain credibility, would you suggest filing a provisional first? And is that enough? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, so, one of the criteria for um, getting a patent is that it ha it's novel. Another one is it's non-obvious. And the novelty um, provision has sort of an intuitive definition that nobody else has invented it before but it has a non-obvious legal definition that nobody in the world knows about it already. So if you've published, presented, even talked about it with somebody outside of your employer, outside of your university, for example, and it revealed enabling details, meaning enough details that somebody else can recreate it, that's considered to be a public disclosure. And most countries of the world say that you can't get a patent on something that you've already disclosed. It's no longer novel by this legal definition of novelty. But if you file a provisional patent application before that public disclosure, then you keep your options open to file a full patent application later in the U.S. and full applications later in other countries. So sometimes we file a provisional prior to a public disclosure and then a year later evaluate. Like are we far enough along? Do we have enough interest? Does it make sense to spend money on a full patent application now? And if so, we can file a full application using that earlier filing date of the provisional, and we can file it at, as a, a PCT application or, a US, or as a US application. If we file it as a P PCT, that gives us the option of later filing in other countries. Alternatively, we could say it's not far enough a year into it. We can, and if we haven't published, publicly disclosed, we could throw away that prior filing date and provisional, file a new provisional with a new filing date and have the whole evaluation a year after that. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions. So, um, 
going to I talked a little bit about novelty. The next standard is, oh, so let me talk a little bit about enabling details. So here are some examples. Some of the things on the left here are, are obvious public disclosures. Um, some less obvious ones are on the right. So federal grant applications, when you submit them and your, your publications and so on, when they're being reviewed, are under confidentiality, but after they're approved for the grant, after they're approved for publication, or not approved, not approved for publication when they are published, even electronically, then it's considered to be a public disclosure. So you have to be careful um, to either file your provisional first or don't give out enabling details. Or the, the other thing I, I, I sort of glossed over is on my slide but didn't mention um, is that the U.S. has a one-year grace period after a public disclosure where you can still file a, a patent application in the U.S. even after public disclosure, but you've lost that option in other countries. Any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so uh, let us just say you had down in this less obvious that you were talking to a company. If the company signed an NDA, does that invalidate your option to get a, I mean, I agree 100%, don't talk about the secret sauce, even with an NDA. I think David drummed that home, but let's just say it was under some sort of confidential discussion. Yeah, that then if, if, if the, the receiving party is under an obligation of confidentiality, then it's not considered to be a public disclosure. So it doesn't trigger the timeline and the one year and losing international rights. Okay. Oh, there we go. So I'm not sure where to go next. I could talk some about how CMU approaches licensing. Um, Maybe we could come back to that. I'm looking at, we have about 10 more minutes. And David, I'm, how much more do you have? You know, I, I, I'm inclined to uh, just, um, my, my inclination is to take questions and see what, see what folks want to talk about. I mean, I can go back, but I, I'm inclined to sort of pause and see if there's things, areas that they'd like to talk about. And also questions you could ask Reed, and if it's something about licensing, you can do that, but okay. So. Just take a are there things, areas that you guys want to talk about? Because we, I think we're down to like 10 minutes that, that we haven't touched on that we should. Um. So while you're thinking about that, I just put into the chat that we have our upcoming Start Smarts. Uh, the next one is on um, uh, structuring your capital raise. Uh, part one, and this sort of gives you all the different sort of the definitions of the terms and what's important. Thursday, October 1, they're all from 5 to 6.30. And then that's followed by a how to structure your capital rates part two, which is literally negotiating a term sheet. And that's October 22nd. And half of you will become the investor, the other half will become the startup. And you will go into separate rooms with lawyers there and you will look at that term sheet and negotiate what your terms are. And we come back and then uh, we look for a volunteer to role play. And um, we hash it out. It's actually a lot of fun and the lawyers kind of make fun of each other. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot. And the last one is how to form your startup company. And that one's November 5th. And we look for volunteers of people who um, will be filing a company uh, that raise their hand and we pair you up with a law student, one or more law students, and they will walk you through the typical process, what lawyers will ask you before forming your company. And you will end up with a roadmap which gives the idea you should be an LLC, you should be a C-Corps, um, you could be in Delaware. These are some of the things you need to put in your operating agreement or your uh, bylaws. Uh, you're not under any obligation to form the company afterwards. Um, you do that when it makes sense. But lawyers love it when you show up with the run uh, with the roadmap and you will know what you're actually signing up for. It just takes less time. So Stephanie or, or uh, David, do you want to add to any of those, any? 
Um, I think the only thing I'd add in terms of entity formation, we, we didn't really talk today about benefit corporations, which for those sort of socially conscious businesses that want to build that into their original entity, there are, there's a specific legal form uh, available in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Um, and we'll talk about that more at the entity formation event. I see a question in the chat about patenting in, in Canada um, and the co relative cost of that versus other countries. So that sets me up to talk a little bit more deeply about what a patent is. And a patent is issued by a particular country. So you don't get a global patent, you get country by country patents. And the patent is gives you the right to stop other people from making and selling your technology. It doesn't necessarily give you the right to make and sell your technology. It gives you the right to exclude others from doing that. So if your invention is a combination of element A and element B, and element A and B are owned by other people, and you combine it into this unique thing, you can get a patent on that unique thing, but you don't necessarily have the right to practice your own invention. So patents are issued by individual countries. So it's really a strategic decision uh, about what countries you want to end up filing in. You can start with sort of this placeholder thing called a PCT application that holds your date for a hundred and some countries, but then you have to end up filing in individual countries and each one of them charges their own filing fees and sometimes you have to pay translators and so on. So you, you have to decide what's the market opportunity and what's the patent enforcement environment in that country? Does it make sense to file in Canada or not? And, you know, Canada's, you know, Western developed country, you know, more sizable market than many countries, but certainly not the largest market, or maybe even not in the top five in terms of markets for most technologies. So you may say, I'll file in the US and that's good enough. That's, you know, for many things, half the world's market. You may say, I wanna file in the US, and the EU and from the EU branch into Germany and England or Japan or Korea, depending on your technology or China. Um, but you don't get a patent in every country. You just can't afford it. So you have to make strategic decisions about, am I actually going to do more business there? Will I have enough economies of scale from having the US market, for example, maybe small number of others that I can compete on price, even if I don't have the patent rights in that individual country. And again, that's to, to emphasize, that's a, um, strategic decision that people ought to make very early on and continue to monitor as to how their um, IP um, strategy. You know, uh, you know is, uh, we all know intellectual property is the sort of, is, is, is the a part of the value that we have in addition to the people and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the other things you're creating. And having a strategy that takes into account something we just talked about, which is the finances and what you can afford. And making decisions about that is really important. And again, you can wave things up front. So it's important to, 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 to develop that strategy. Uh, relatedly, we didn't talk about this, but I want to spend one moment on um, when we talk about intellectual property and, the, the, and protecting what you have. Uh, and I think Don sort of alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, you hire people and then they leave. Um, and so one way to protect your intellectual property is to make sure that employees, independent contractors sign non-disclosure agreements, which we've talked a little bit about, but also restricted covenants. So it's a shame to have uh, you know, a founder um, go and compete with the company. So we try to have them sign non-competes, non-solicits. Um, so they're not soliciting the employees and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, employees and, con and third parties. Uh, relationships. So as you're thinking about that, another way to think about how to protect your intellectual property is to have employees and third parties, uh, independent contractors sign non-competes. And of course, there's all kinds of, it has to be reasonable and you have to, in the employment context, and there's some rules related to it, but uh, but you know, generally in most jurisdictions, they're enforceable as long as you're reasonable. 
so that's something to think about as well. That's something that investors and, and, and others will look at to make sure that you're, again, you're not, your key people aren't leaving and competing with the company. I just, this is a general comment for uh, the CMU community. Um, we have what's called office hour experts and we have a whole section on, on legal. So we have some lawyers who have signed up to talk with you about a half hour. This is before you actually formally sign up with a lawyer, not representing you or anything. But if you just have this, you're confused about something, you don't know whether to go right or left, or you heard something, is it true or not? Uh, you can sign up for office hours. Babs had to sign off early, and I'm not sure what provisions they have. Tiffany, maybe you know, uh, for the Pitt students. Or, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I just, uh, I don't know if you have the equivalent of whether you have legal clinics or lawyers who come in and um, meet with the startups or not. So I will just say David is one of our office hour experts who's volunteered to generously give his time. Um, but this doesn't mean everybody <laughs> runs off to office hours mm -hmm. at some point. Um, so again, they're, if you want them to do work for the, you, you have to hire them. But if you have so just some general questions, uh, you can help with that. And Pitt has something similar as well. Do they? I just yeah. didn't know what. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure off the top of my head. That's probably a more like more of a Babs question. Okay. Yeah, but she had to leave. So okay. So we have two more minutes. Last. Who wants the last question? Kyle, you got all yours answered, all about your vesting and all that? I think I'll have more questions as we go along. I kind of want to talk with the rest of the team first and go through everything that we learned today and kind of went over that first, though. Good. Okay. Good. All right. Actually, well, here is a question. Oh, you went on mute, Kyle. Is that better? Yeah, now we can hear you. So I know Pitt and CMU both have uh, internal um, lawyers that are willing to work with students and things like that. I'm curious, David, if you know any external lawyers or groups that do pro bono work um, or things like that, that work with internal Pennsylvania companies, um, things like that. I know Penn State, they have one legal counsel, but. So, so um, there's, um, so there's, I mean, we do these uh, this um, office hours, which is pro bono. You know, you so get some advice on that, um, and um, and I'll I'll yield to Stephanie for in a moment to see if there's you know internal uh, within Pitt whether there's like uh, the students are willing to do some pro bono work for with startup companies. Um, by and large, the um, the way we do it, and I think most startup companies, startup lawyers work is that they basically work for reduced rates, so it's not quite pro bono but they do it on, on sort of a, a, a amazingly discounted rate with startup companies to get them started um, and with the hope that they'll become hugely successful and they'll, and they'll take it out of the other end. Um, uh, but uh, so there's, so while they're call pro bono, they end up working with people at a relatively modest sum uh, in order to, to uh, work with you going, going forward. Yeah, and unfortunately, Pitt doesn't have a transactional legal clinic that can offer free advice. Um, and, you know, law students can't offer legal advice because they're not uh, qualified as lawyers. I mean, um, you know, they can uh, certainly in the legal roadmap session, you'll get an opportunity there to work with a law student under the supervision of David and other lawyers. So on the entity formation and some of the sort of founding issues. Um, you'll walk away with a, you know, a pretty good idea of what next steps are. Okay, great. Thank you both. Thanks, Tom. All right. So, um, well, you know where to find us if you have more questions. I hope to see everybody back on October 1st for how to structure your capital raise. And um, so 630 is up. Any last words for the good of the Thank cause? Thank you. Thank you, David. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. This was it was what well, David and Reed. Um, and Reed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was just uh, exactly what we were hoping for. And you're all good. a good audience too. Good question. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, team. Okay. Good to see all everybody. Right. I'm gonna Bye. sign Bye. off. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.